Uh, my allotted time has come, so I, I will begin. I'm going to plan to speak for probably 25 minutes, and then they'll give us 10, 15 minutes for questions uh, and discussion. And I hope we'll have a chance to do a bit of that. And I, in those 25 or so minutes, I'm going to pack quite a lot of stuff in. So uh, forgive me if the pace of this is quite quick. The slides themselves, by the way, I've, I have, um, uh, they're on a website with a link that I tweeted this morning. Uh, and it's the only tweet I sent this morning. So uh, if you find me there, if you don't already uh, follow Profco and um, follow that link, you can download the PowerPoint for yourselves, assuming you have some connectivity um, and that the server doesn't crash when lots of people do that. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about research, some problems with research as I see it and evidence and the limits of what research can tell us. And then say some things about practice and how I think uh, practice can be improved with basically four things that we can do that, that would make a difference, I think. Okay, so research. What are the problems? Well, all kinds of problems here. One is that um, evidence is used in a range of ways. Some people talk about evidence-based education. Some people talk about evidence-informed. There's a continuum, I guess, between evidence-based, where evidence really drives what you do in terms of policy, in terms of practice, down to at the other end where you perhaps don't take any notice at all of evidence. And evidence-informed is perhaps on the way. Evidence-garnished uh, practice where uh, evidence isn't really leading, but it sits on top, and so on. And the problem is that um, there's evidence to support any position. We can all find evidence to argue for whatever um, prejudice we have. Um, I heard um, a senior person in Ofsted speaking recently, talking about how schools should be collecting evidence to prove that their pupil premium spending was having a beneficial effect and had narrowed the gap. And it just seemed to me that's the wrong way round. We, if we're, you know, we, we start with a question, we collect the evidence, and then we, we answer it. Um, and I think that mentality is, is um, I don't know if I can blame Ofsted for that, but uh, I think it, it's pervasive. And I think the other organization, I mentioned the DFE on the slide there, but plenty of other commissioners of research and users of research uh, and uh, people who, who quote research, I think, either misunderstand it or misuse it or um, make mistakes, and that's problematic in all kinds of ways. So, you know, these are, these are difficult issues for us. There are some problems with research itself, and these are real problems too. So one is that the quality of educational research is very variable, but a lot of it really isn't very good. Um, whether I could say most of it isn't very good, I don't know, but certainly uh, there is a lot there which isn't very good. But we shouldn't dismiss it all because some of it is good. And that's, that's a real problem, actually. How do we know which bits are good? How do we know which research we should be taking notice of and which research is, um, is poor quality? And that is a difficult one. I know. Um, uh, Dan Willingham's book on should, should We Trust the Experts, is it called? Um, uh, helps us there, possibly. Uh, but I think that's a problem, and I think it's a problem even if you are a researcher, but certainly if you're not a researcher, uh, how do you know which bits of research are, are, are valid and trustworthy? And that, can you get access to it anyway? Uh, a lot of it is behind paywalls, it's in academic journals, um, it's not easy to access. A lot of uh, what goes on in academic debates, I think, is, is far removed from practitioners' concerns. Pointless, perhaps, but certainly not relevant to uh, my concerns if I'm a teacher in a classroom. And I think it's a consequence of um, the generally low standard of, of um, quality in the educational research world that the process of peer review itself doesn't really work very well. So, um, because your things are reviewed by your peers, and most of your peers, um, or many of your peers, don't necessarily have that good judgment themselves. 
On the other hand, I do think that um, there are some positives here. One is uh, in, from universities, we are now all being judged against whether our research has impact. So we can't just stay in the ivory tower and, and carry on publishing stuff that nobody reads because uh, one of our, our performance indicators, one of our league table metrics is going to depend on has it, has it actually benefited anyone. And that's new for us, so um, you can imagine that's uh, stirred things up a bit. I think the Educational Endowment Foundation is a very positive development. I think uh, the kinds of research they're funding and the amounts of money they're giving to it is really changing people's minds about whether, whether you, you know, hardly anyone now is saying you can't do randomized trials in education because they've got 125 million pounds that says you can and, it, and no one else is giving money for much research in education. So that's really changed people's thinking. Um, uh, the policy interest, and, and Ben Goldacre is one of the people, but there's a lot of things going on there. And I wrote a little piece that tried to sort of track some of that history, which is the link there. And I do actually think, and one of the things that's interesting today, is, is the role of, of blogging and social media in this. Because again, there's some really good stuff out there. Uh, there's some mixed quality stuff too, but most of the stuff I read from, from bloggers and tweeters actually uh, I would say is, is on the whole very good and much of it is better than stuff that I read in academic journals. Better in terms of its, its uh, research methodology and, and kind of clarity of thinking. Not just better in terms of being more relevant. Um, so that's a really interesting development I think. Okay, so that's just a, a, a few words about research. And in a way, that's the most depressing bit of what I want to say because I don't really have any, uh, any strategies to, make that, to help to make that better. Um, I don't know how you improve the quality of a whole discipline uh, from, you know, by pulling up from the bootstraps. How do you do that? Any ideas would be very welcome. Uh, we've got 15 minutes for discussion, so just think about that. Uh, but I do have some suggestions about practice, and I imagine most people here are, are teachers, practitioners, so hopefully you'll be interested to hear this. So one is that we do have a lot of evidence already about the impact of different strategies, and this is the two, uh, right, okay, well, if you can see the screen at all, um, the, the EF toolkit um, on the Education Endowment Foundation website is a document that tries to summarize the evidence about what the research says about the impact of different strategies. And uh, we're in our um, second main iteration of that, released in, a, in January, I think. Uh, work is going on to do more with that. And the intention is a simplified device. I'm sure people have seen this simplified summary um, that, that is accessible to teachers and can be used to make decisions about what's worth doing. And the, the overall summary, again, shame that the, uh, the, the visuals aren't great here, um, but, but this is a summary of, of the evidence that's summarized in the toolkit. So we've got things here that are very effective and reasonably cheap, and down here things that are uh, not particularly effective and certainly not um, good value for money because they're very expensive. And, oh, am I lost? No. Um, and so these are the ones to back, obviously. Don't bother with those. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. Uh, so that's important. That's had, a, that's had an impact, I think. Lots of schools say they use that. Um, lots of teachers want to argue about stuff in there to do with things like um, smaller classes and teaching assistants. And, uh, in my experience, those arguments, discussions, perhaps I should say, have been one of the most positive things to come out of it. Um, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. But one of the things that is clear to me now is that I'm not sure that we ever thought it was quite this simple, but the idea that you'd, you'd look at this uh, impact against cost, cost-benefit type model and say, right, well, we'll just pick those things in the top left and we'll do those. Uh, off you go. I don't think we ever thought that, but it's very clear that isn't, that isn't going to work. And um, 
The problem is, well, there's a whole series of problems, but it, it's just never going to be that simple. Uh, a lot of these things we've been doing for a long time. The classic example, I think, is um, assessment for learning, which is it's right up there in the top left of that graph. It, it's feedback, it's metacognition. So the research evidence is, is impeccable and strong, big effects in research studies. Everyone's doing ass assessment for learning, been doing it for many years. It's been promoted by government, it's been funded, there's been training. All teachers are doing it, aren't you? Uh, and yet it's had no impact at all in the 13 or so, 15, 10 years, however long it is since the, the policy really hit big time. Uh, and let's not pretend, of course, that, that no one was doing the, any of those things before then, but a national campaign to get people doing those kinds of things hasn't seemed to have made any difference to overall standards of attainment. So how can that be? If everyone's doing it and the research shows it works beautifully, why hasn't it made a, f a phenomenal difference? You know, if we had the benefit that the research says it should have been, it wouldn't be Singapore at the top, it would be us over that time period. We'd be easily ahead of Singapore, and we're not. We're still, you know, in the middle where we were before. So I think the problem is about how how we get people to change what they're doing. How do we get teachers who are doing it a bit or um, uh, maybe not doing it at all, maybe they're doing token aspects of it, but not the real thing. There have been some quite interesting blogs, that, you know, a good example of what I'm saying about AFL recently, three or four blogs. Um, old Andrew's blog on that in the last week or so I thought was very good. I don't know if Old Andrew's here. Perhaps you'd like to reveal yourself if you are. Um, be nice. Sorry? Old Andrew. I think, is it Old Andrew UK? It's not his real name. <laughs> so I'm told. Um, but there's been several blogs on AFL and, and, you know, talking about the kind of tokenistic way, you know, you have mini whiteboards and you have traffic lights and you have Walt and Wilf and those kinds of things. That's not formative assessment, really. Okay, so what can we do? That's, that's what we can't do. Uh, well, um, just four things. Can't be that hard. I've got 12 minutes. 